ties together what John has been saying up to this point. And we're going to really tie in what I believe is the main theme of this text, which is the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, giving us direction, wisdom, teaching us. And because of that, number one, you cannot lose the faith which God freely gave to you. But number two, it's very difficult to be pushed aside by false believers. Now, I don't want to go too far with that, and I'll explain that in a minute. But I want you to look at verse number 18, please. And please, let's keep this in context. And sometimes if we go through the Scriptures line by line, the Bible was written, obviously, one verse after another, and they tie together. That's why it's very, very dangerous when you hear some types of preaching where they grab a verse here, they grab a verse here, they grab a verse here, and they create some type of a doctrinal position that may or may not be biblical. But let's look at verse number 18. And remember the context in which this has been penned thus far is Paul, excuse me, John is writing and he's giving several tests we find. And we have what one we call the social test of the general believer. Now the social test of the general believer is regarding, do you love God and your neighbor? Love each other. Remember we talked about that in chapter 1, and that would we call, if some could call it, the social test. Then he gives a doctrinal test of the genuine believer. He accepts God, that's what we find here, is the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, the deity, God, all God, all man. And then later on, there's the moral test, we'll go through later, of a genuine believer that he walks in the light. And we talked about that actually a little bit in chapter 2. And then we come to the identity of the Christian. Some people call this the fruit test, which we find it produces fruit. And we will go through that as we move on. But right here, we come into verse number 18. Little children, it is the last time. Some translations say it's the end time. We're getting toward the end. And you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Now that's still looking to the future. But I don't, that's not really the emphasis here. Because read on. Even now, there are many, what? Antichrist, plural, whereby we know it is the last time. So we're putting the emphasis there on the last part of verse number 18, Antichrist, many Antichrists. Now we know when we look at Revelation, we look at the apocalyptic literature of the Bible, Matthew chapter 24, the last part of Matthew chapter 24, we know there will be an Antichrist, but that is not what he's talking about here at all. He's talking about the Antichrist, and he defines, he gives a definition of Antichrist in this text, because I want you to look at verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is Christ? So those that are liars is denying that Jesus is Christ, God's Son. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father in the Son. So what we're dealing with here is a the Gnostics who were uh, who, who had somewhat of an effect in this particular book, but more uh, earlier in the book of Ephesians. But what we're looking here is they were denying that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And what he's saying here is those are the Antichrist, plural, that you're dealing with that have left you Because he goes on in verse 19 and says, They went out from us because they were not of us. So we'll get, we'll tie this together. But the bottom line, as we go through this text tonight, I want you to keep, and you look at the title of my message, is the unction. Now that word unction comes from the Greek word that means anointing. So we could say the anointing and the anointing, but I thought the unction and anointing, we throw that in together because those two words were used interchangeably so. 
but the unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us. It's the Holy Spirit that guides us. It's the Holy Spirit, now don't miss this, that keeps us from falling, don't miss this, into apostasy, which he was talking about in verse number 19, those that went out from us. The Holy Spirit convicts. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in your prayer closet or praying or ready to make a decision and God convicted you of something? That's true. Say amen and raise your hand, right? The Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. And that's what he has, he has given these folks that John is writing to an encouragement, in many ways, a big high five. Guys, you already got it. You've got it. Those folks that went out there, they, you don't need to be taught anymore. You understand the truth because you had the unction and anointing of God. Now, this is so, so encouraging to me and to you. And we'll, we'll kind of unpack that here in a minute. Turn to John chapter 14, verse number 26, please. John chapter 14. We could just kind of spend several weeks going through the doctrine of the Holy Spirit here, but that's really what he is dealing with here in this text. John 14, 26. Now we know one of the words when we translate from Greek and English, one of the words that's used in the King James translation is the word comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. And it says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he, that's a person now, and we could just get on that for a while, shall teach you what? All things. And bring all things to your what? Remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. See, there's all kind of crooks out there and counterfeits. And, you know, if we look at even money, people are trying to exchange money. And uh, in the antiquities of the old, they would take gold coins and they would fill them with lead. And the, the little boy, I remember uh, when I was a little boy, uh, you know, I know you guys never did anything wrong, but we had slugs sometimes we would try to, you know, put in machines and stuff like that. Now, don't, I'm not endorsing that. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen, right? But, uh, you know, there's always kind of counterfeits out there. In fact, occasionally our men that count the money here will say somebody put in Canadian money, you know, and uh, I guess you won in the casino, you felt guilty, so when you come to church the next day, you have to put it in there at the Canadian casino, so some of you have the inability to have any humor at all. <laughs> Pastor, God's giving me the spirit of having a bad spirit, <laughs> but anyway, this we find that, but there's counterfeits. And what we're finding here in this text, there were counterfeits. In the first century, the last surviving disciple, which is John, warned this first generation of millennials, if you want to call them, about the counterfeit messages that were going out there. And he's telling them, you have all you need. You have the Spirit of God. Don't listen to him. And he didn't waste much time. So let's go on to, number one, watch and test. And we'll walk through the verses number 18 and 19. But let's go to verse 19. We read verse number 18. Now I've heard what, and I'm not saying, look, I am a sinner saved by grace, and I sure am not the greatest orator or expositor of Scripture. But I've heard some of the most silly preaching on verse number 19 that absolutely is, is ridiculous when it comes to looking at the context in which it was written. And I won't get into that, but some people say, oh, that's people that don't like the pastor. That, that's not what he's talking about. That's people didn't like the color of the carpet and they left the church. Or that's, pe you know, that's kind of silly stuff. But that's not what he's saying there. Listen, let's go. They went out from us because they were none of us. Listen, they weren't saved. They were apostates. It wasn't like they were trying to split a church or anything. They weren't even of the brethren. And he goes on and says, for they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us in a church. It's very difficult to remain in a church year after year. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. 
But to be unsaved, hear message after message, and then to add to that what they were doing, not only were they not saved, they were preaching a false doctrine on top of that. And look what it says here. And they, that they might be manifest, that word re revealed, that they were not of us. So we find that what first, first one I want to go through is there's a watching and a testing. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 5 says, They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. They were attracting people. Now when we look at the Antichrist in verse number 18, plural, it's defined in verse number 22, which we just read. Antichrist against Christ. Those, it's according to verse number 22, that denieth the Father and the Son. They deny it. Antichrist. It says in verse number 18, we're in the last hour. Despite the lapse of centuries since John wrote this text, the stage has been set for history's final drama. Most Bible commentators, and they were familiar with the Antichrist of the apocalyptic literature, they were familiar with that, but that's not who he's talking about. Antichrist are those that denied Jesus as the Son of God. We find in 2 Timothy 3.1, Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. We find in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 36, By that day and hour no man knoweth, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 3 says this, Knowing this first, they shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lust. And we can connect the dots today and draw that that is no doubt occurring, but it has been occurring for centuries as well. The Antichrist of Revelation, the Antichrist, the one that will come, that will reign in Jerusalem for a period of time, he's called the lawless one. He's called the little horn of Daniel 7. He's called the beast in Revelation 13. He's called the man of sin and perdition in 2 Thessalonians. He's called the abomination of desolation in Matthew chapter 24. He's called the man whose name represents 666 in Revelation chapter 13. However, all that being said, that's not the emphasis here. Through history, think about the Antichrist that had been called out. Nebuchadnezzar was thought. Darius, the Medes, Alexander the Great, Stalin, Mussolini, Lenin, Castro, even Saddam Hussein and Adolf Hitler. But John says the Antichrist is coming, and the Antichrist there have gone out from us because they're not of us. In verse 22, he defines that position. Christ deniers. John says these false teachers were once part of the fellowship. Normally false teaching has a background of belief, and we see that. And there's false teaching all over the place even today. It says they went out of us. They were, it wasn't some church split over the teen group or the color of the carpet and, or that type of thing. It was a total depravity of mankind and denying the basic tenets of Christianity was that Jesus Christ was God. They didn't belong to him. Let's look at the second one here. Let's move on. They were to be filled with the Spirit. I want you to go to verse 21. 20. Now he says all that, and this is interesting, if you build the case. Look here. He says, okay, here's who they are. But I like verse number 20. What is the first English word we find? But, I like that. When you see that in Bible if you want to interpret the Bible, there's a change there. But, 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 but you. You don't have to believe that stuff. You ever heard anybody say that? Now, you don't have to believe that. I don't believe any of this stuff. I heard a message one time. My pastor said he was in a chapel message. And most of you know Dr. Lee Robertson. He was the president of Tennessee Temple University for decades. Had a great ministry. Uh, many preachers came out of them. And had a guy one time that was preaching chapel. And he was just waxing eloquent and in front of the large chapel. That time the school maybe had 1,300, 1,400 students in it. 
and Lee Robertson was sitting right there, and I guess if you wanted to be done preaching, he, was a, he would kind of rattle his, his change in his pocket. And this guy got preaching, he preached, and I'm not sure what it was on, but whatever it was, it bothered Dr. Robertson. So he got up there and says, okay, student body, let's all stand up and I'll close the prayer, but we don't believe anything that guy just said. And he says, amen, go home. So, <laughs> you know, when I says, oh my, well, that's kind of what we're saying here. He says, but you have an unction of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you have the anointing and you know what? All things. You don't have to believe that stuff. That stuff is wrong. It's bad doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. And look what he says in verse, <laughs> verse 21. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth. You already know it. You know this stuff. Have you ever said to your kids sometimes, yeah, you know that, you can do better than that. You know that one plus one is equal to two. Unless it's, you know, this moral equivalence we talked about this morning, because one plus one is equal to two, but that's what you think is equal to two. I think it's equal to three, so who are you to say that I'm not right, you know? <laughs> one thing I liked about uh, this little side note here, will you give me a little liberty tonight? Here's the great thing about mathematics. It's either right or wrong. Amen. So if you are considering a future and anything that's doctrinally pure, major in something that has science or math in it. My wife's saying, we better not take this too far, okay. But it says there, look what he says, you know the truth. I've not written it because you know not the truth, but because you know it and there is no lie in the truth. Verse 21. That anointing is no doubt the Holy Spirit, since verse 27 proof texts that. It teaches that this anointing is conceived of a person, the person of God, the person of the triune Godhead, one of the triune Holy Spirit of God. John wrote that because their apprehension of the truth was correct. The truth should never be confused with a lie. Now go back to John, the Gospel of John. Let's Walk through this slowly, just for a second. Chapter number 14, please. John 14. People try to confuse people. Now, we believe, I hope we believe this. We've, I've taught it, and maybe we need a refresher. We believe that once you get saved, by saved, I mean this. You realize you were a sinner. You asked Jesus Christ to save you from your sin. And you repented unto salvation. And we believe that's how we get saved. Right? Now, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. That's called the dwelling of the Spirit. When you hear me sometimes saying the word filling of the Spirit, it doesn't mean I'm getting more of the Holy Spirit. You get all the Holy Spirit you ever get at salvation. The word filling sometimes is confused because we the different ways we take it out of, the, out of the Bible, filling means to be controlled by the Spirit. And sometimes uh, those that have a different doctrinal position on on the spirit will say, oh, fill me, fill me, like you're somehow filling up a gas tank or something. That's not what it means. It means to be controlled. So when you get saved and I get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you to lead, to teach, to guide in your life. Amen? Is that right or not? So if that's true, we can't lose it, correct? It was a gift from God. So if we have the Holy Spirit, we can grieve the Spirit, no doubt, and that happens. doesn't mean we're in sinless perfection. But what we find here is the Holy Spirit is a teacher. Now go back to John 14. I want to read that through slowly one more time. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, 1426. 
Whom the Father was sent in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring into remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. So what he's saying, John is saying in 1 John, is that you have the anointing and the unction of the Holy Spirit. Don't listen to these people. Stop it. And I'll say that today as well. So, we have the Holy Spirit gives us, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to go to um, 1 Peter. Can we go to 1 Peter? I want to show you something. And I don't want to get into the, I don't like to say once saved, always saved. I like to say we have eternal security. Now, they could say once saved, always saved. That's, you know, one way to put it. But look what it says in 1 Peter, chapter number 1, verse number 3. First Peter was an epistle written to a persecuted church. I believe my wife's Bible study is going through that, is correct? And Anne's detailed preparation for this message and giving me my text, he said, make sure you cover this tonight. Some of you just absolutely do not understand. See, where are you going with this? How would you like to be in her seat, having your spouse up there saying, what is coming next, right? Anyway, look what it says in verse number three. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according, verse number three, 1 Peter 1, 3, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, from the dead. Now that's good stuff, right? Now look at the next verse. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth what? It ain't going away. Reserved in heaven for you. Are you with me? Now look at the next verse. It ought to just jump off the page. You ought to have it circled, underlined, exclamation point, etc., etc. Who are what? Are you kept by your good works? No. Are you kept by any works that we do? Are you kept? No, it says kept by what? The power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. And I can proof text the eternal security doctrine on and on and on again. But here's the point. We are filled with the Spirit. Number three, let's go back to our text, 1 John chapter 2. Beware of the antichrists, plural should be. Beware of those folks. And you can fill in the blank and call, there's many things that were being taught. There's many people who say this, well, I believe that Jesus was a good man. I worked with some of the sweetest, nicest, most moral. They would give you the shirt off their back. They have been to my house. We have been to their house. We have broken bread together. They're Muslims that I used to work with, engineers. Their kids played with our kids. And they would say, we believe in Jesus, yeah, the Jesus. We believe in the Jesus that you believe in. I said, no, you don't. And they said, we believe he was a prophet. He was a good man. He did all the great things, but we do not believe he was God. Well, if you don't believe he was God, then he was a liar, and he was a lunatic, and it's been the greatest fraud ever perpetrated on mankind. So have your choice. And there are people out there today, even in quote what we call quasi-Christian areas. And what we're saying is, he's saying here in 1 John chapter 2, it says, beware these people. Now look what it says, we must hurry, verse 20. I have not written unto you because you know not that you know not the truth, but because you know it, and there's no lie in the truth. And then Excuse me, and then, I'm at the wrong verse, I'm sorry. Look at verse 22. Who is a liar, excuse me, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, and he is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Verse 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, are you with me? The same if not the Father. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, I love God, but I don't love Christ. They're one and the same. He that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Verse 24, 
Let that therefore abide. That word abide is an interesting word. It shows up three times here. It comes from the Greek word. It means to remain. Let that remain in you. Which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall, you shall continue in the Son and in the Father. It's all about the deity of Christ. John 4, 29 says this, Come see a man which I told me all the things I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Talking about the woman at the well. And he said to the woman, Now believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that indeed this is Christ, the Savior of the world. John 20, 31 says this, But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing ye might have life through His name. And we go on and on. And John 10.30 says, I and my Father are one. So we see that. Verse 24. As I read, that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. One cannot have the Father without the Son. Period. And you know what happens? There's a lot of people who don't believe that. Right now, out there. It's Jesus saying, you know, talk about God in this general term. We love God, we believe in God. And that, but when you start talking about Jesus, you reject something. Antichrist against Christ. Antichrist. Interesting. I try not to get all worked up over end time prophecy. If you're not careful, you'll spend your entire life trying to figure out what God says you're not supposed to figure out anyway. By the way, if God wanted us to know everything about Revelation, and he wanted us everything about all the apocalyptic literature, don't you think he would have spelled it out? But he says... The son doesn't know the day or hour. You know, and that's why I think sometimes people spend all this time about that, but yet they can't witness to their neighbor who needs the Lord. Unction and anointing. We find here in the last part I want to talk about is remain and abide, which really are the same thing. Look what it says in verse 27. Verse 27. Well, let me go first. Let me keep on reading it. Verse 25, it says, And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, remaineth of you, and need not that any man teach you. You don't need to listen to this. But as the same anointing teacheth you. In other words, the anointing, the Holy Spirit, gives us direction. Let me give you an example real quickly. I believe biblically that, listen to this, and I'm almost done, that if you accept Christ as your Savior, that God, through the Holy Spirit, and I'm a, I'm a believer in this because it's happened to me and to my wife and many in this church, and you start opening the Scriptures, God will unfold his plan for your life. You believe that? Say amen. I mean, I've seen it. And he teaches it. Prior to salvation through me, I read verses. They did their verse, this verse they died, sort of. But then I got saved, and I was sitting in a Bible study in a pastor's home on Acts chapter 2, and I go, wow, that's pretty good stuff. Well, I never saw that before. Then I started reading Matthew, and I go, wow, that was really neat. You know what that was? And I'm not trying to be trivial. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes. What does Paul say in um, 1 Corinthians? The natural man understandeth not the things of God, for they are foolish unto them. And what I'm saying to you is, is John is nailing this down. He's saying, you have this. 
you don't need to be taught again by that group over there. Abide is to remain. He says in verse 27, these things, or verse 26, these things have I written to you that concerning those that seduced you, verse 27, but the anointing which ye have received of him remains or abides in you, and ye need not any man teach you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you. In other words, it's the anointing of God that teaches you. When I preach here, I do my best to exposit the scriptures, help understand, maybe define certain terms, give a little context of when this was written, a doctrinal position about the Bible and what may be saying here, but ultimately that's nothing but words for eggheads. And I don't mean to say that wrong if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God. God teaches you. The man behind a plow in India can understand the Word of God as a doctorate, person with a PhD or doctorate out of some Bible college. God gives us enlightenment and anointing through the Holy Spirit of God. And that's what he's saying. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not any man teach you, but is the same anointing teacheth you, of all things is truth, and is no lie, and even as it is taught you, ye shall abide in him. In other words, he says the anointing teaches you of all things, and it is truth, and is not a lie, even as it is ta- even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Verse 28, don't miss this. And now, little children, abide in him. It's pretty good to know that we have what we have. I have all I need. You have all you need. We just got to grow in grace. So the whole point of tonight's message, the whole point is the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We'll find in Romans, I believe it's Romans, says we know not how to pray as we ought, but with groanings which cannot be uttered. God help us. I'll give you a little secret and I'm done. This is it. You want know to change your life? Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you and speak to you. No, there's no audible voice that gets up and says, no, I want you to do this. But God will give direction. If that's not true, then I am a liar. And what I've experienced has been nothing more than mysticism. But if it is true, it can help you as well. Let's all stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this text this evening. And Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, I pray for 